Hello, everyone. This is Al Fadi, and I want to welcome you to a very special live stream with our sister, Daughter of Christ. It's always special, of course, to have uh, her on the show and also to interact with former Muslims like myself, and especially those who are servant of the Lord. Today's topic is very sensitive, and I appreciate everyone's at least attention to it. And at the same time, we want to take it very seriously. We're not here really to point fingers uh, in particular at any uh, group, uh, if you wish. Uh, we're only going to talk about our own experience as ex-Muslims, as the title indicated, and our connection uh, between this path that we have chosen to leave Islam and persecution in general. And I would argue this persecution not only comes from uh, Muslims or from the teaching of Islam, Sometimes we face it even from others as well. And as the uh, Lord leads the show today, if uh, we're prompted to share a few examples with you from certain incidents and things like that, we may do this without mentioning possibly names or any particular locations, obviously, because we want to be respectful for everyone. But uh, between myself and uh, our dear sister here, we will give you references, whether from the Islamic sources or from biblical sources. With that in mind, I want to welcome, of course, our dear sister here, and uh, we are so honored to have you. God bless you, brother. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's uh, a very important subject. Uh, it's a subject that gives us great concern uh, as followers of Christ. And uh, I thank the Lord every day you are safe and alive. <laughs> and my brothers and sisters who are doing this work or have left Islam are safe and alive because of um, the subject of this stream, brother. The persecution of um, ex-Muslims and especially those who come to Christ because they face the uh, antichrist devilish ideology, religion of Islam, that legislates, actively legislates the murder, hatred against them and persecution against them. Indeed, indeed. and. Uh... I mean, I want to start by talking just briefly about myself. Uh, for instance, uh, the moment I left Islam, I faced severe attacks and persecutions at all levels. In my case, at all levels, all at once within three months. Um, it was at the religious level or spiritual warfare, if you wish. And I'm thankful for uh, many believers that the Lord uh, helped, uh, you know, having around me to disciple me and to counsel me. But then there were the uh, physical, uh, you know, uh, part of it. There was the social part of it. Uh, and there was the financial part of it, uh, just to name a few. And uh, till this day, parts of those, uh, you know, elements have been lost. Uh, connection with the family is not as good as it used to be. I haven't seen my mother or hugged my mother or touched my mother in over 20 years. Uh, something very painful, of course, and uh, and the list can go on and on and on. But, you know, it's almost like an overnight change. All of a sudden, you go from up here to down here, just like that. Now, if I may ask, you know, and, and of course, you have the freedom to answer whatever you would like to answer and turn down whatever you feel like you're uncomfortable answering. But, but in general, you know, tell me more about your own experience uh, when you left Islam. Did you face anything immediately or was it a gradual uh, type of pressure and persecution? First of all, I'm really sorry to hear that, brother. And um, it's uh, it hurts, hurts to hear it. Uh, obviously, um, you know, you're going through this. Um, I, I won't um, pretend that it's anything like that. But um, yes, is the answer. Um, the minute you confess anything that, that that you believe in anything other than Muhammad and Allah and Islam, uh, whether directly or indirectly, it starts. And it starts from the people that you love the most. It starts from the people you know the most, who you never think will turn against you, your community that you've spent your life, spent your life with. And um, you, it, they basically all, just like the Lord um, Jesus says, uh, a man's enemies will be members of his own household. And that is exactly what happens in a Muslim household when somebody in that household says, I don't believe in Muhammad anymore. I don't believe in the Quran anymore. Uh, I believe in Christ. They switch like a light switch. And it's extremely scary 
It varies um, in severity depending on where you are in the world and the type of family you have, the type of environment you have, but it happens every time. And if you happen to live in an Islamic country, the whole country is against you, the law is against you. Um, Muslim countries do legislate against um, people who lead Islam, against apostates, in terms of things like inheritance, uh, capital punishment. Um, even if you die, if they kill you, they don't bury you with your family. They bury you. Um, they don't bury you with the Muslims. It is. Um, and if you happen to be married to a Muslim, they separate you by force. It is just. Um, it's out of this world type persecution. Indeed, and even if someone, let's say, reverted back to Islam, you cannot be trusted. Uh, no. You will be treated with skepticism. Um, and that is almost like a target on your back. Uh, people cannot really uh, entrust you with things anymore. And it's almost like, you know, um, uh, you know, damn if you do, damn if you don't, you know. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's almost like uh, there is this constant, constant attack. Uh, and uh, the interesting part about the persecution that Islam teaches is that the God of Islam is so weak that he has to rely on his followers to enforce his false religion. Uh, absolutely, brother. So I see is Islam as this like very fragile ego of Muhammad. And it's translated to Islam itself being so fragile in its ego up to this day, 1400 years later, that if you dare even turn away from it, walk away from it, you become public enemy number one. And you must, you must be exterminated. You know, it's so weak. It can't, it, it can't even tolerate your presence. Uh, even if you're peaceful, even if you don't say anything against the religion, if you leave it, you die. And um, it's interesting, brother, that you said, you, even if you go back, you can't be trusted. Um, actually, in some schools of thought, brother, of Islam, um, you're not allowed to even recant or repent, like the Jafari uh, school of thought, which I read up upon today. Um, it says repentance will not save uh, um, an ex-Muslim actually from execution, even if he repents. Uh, they ex are executed immediately. Um, and um, some, some schools of thought don't even give you a waiting period, like the Hanbali school of thought. They just kill you immediately. Exactly. And, and of course, uh, they probably will justify it from the Quran because the God of the Quran says that the, the only unpardonable sin uh, is that the sin of shirk, obviously, and associating someone with him. And as you know, our Muslim friends always assume that the fact that you follow Jesus, that means you are committing idolatry, that you are worshiping a man and that you are worshiping the cross and the list can go on and on and on when in fact that's not the truth at all the bible never ever teaches idolatry in fact the god of the bible was always attacking idols and idol worship and emphasizing that there is only one true god the maker of heavens and earth and he is the one that came to us in the flesh so that he can show us the way uh, to heaven and to reconcile us back to himself. But, you know, if someone doesn't know this meta narrative, uh, they can unfortunately uh, and, and sadly be misled to believe these fable stories and these myths concerning our faith. Now, um, do you know of any um, in your immediate sphere or maybe throughout the years as a follower of Jesus who suffered uh, for the sake of coming to Christ or at least leave in Islam. Of course, we don't want to mention names and feel free not even to mention a gender if you like, but just for the interest of people hearing about the different types of, uh, you know, or forms of persecution people can go through. Yes, brother. Um, every single person I know who came to Christ from Islam suffered in horrific ways. Uh, without mentioning any names, um, I know, um, ladies who were thrown out of their homes um they were married and they were the marriage one was annulled the, you know their uh, husband left and they were alone um you know against their will uh, I, I know ladies who've had their children taken away from them um again against their will uh they haven't seen their children for years um 
men and women, not just women. Um, and uh, many people who actually don't want to say, they don't want to say that they've come to Christ. They have to live this double life of being Muslim on the outside and Christian on the inside, which is not something I would ever recommend that you do. Um, but they've had to do that because of the intense situation that they find themselves in. Not only do they have to worry about their own safety, but they worry about the backlash against their family who are still Muslim from the community who will target them and persecute even them. You believe this? Even the Muslim families who haven't not done anything, they get secondhand persecution. And um, the way I see it, brother, is it's against all ex-Muslims, but ex-Muslim Christians, people who come to Christ, they have it the worst because... Yeah, I'm sure you know, brother, the first thing you learn before you even know who Muhammad is, is Surah 112, which is Antichrist. It says, Allah has no son. He neither begets nor is he begotten and none is equivalent to him. That is the Antichrist spirit that denies father and son, like it says in 1 John 2. And so when a Muslim comes to Christ, he has done the absolute blasphemy and uh, apostasy. Um persecuted worse than you know atheists and agnostics who muslims do tolerate but if you become a christian the antichrist spirit in islam will come after you hard and they see you as never forgiven in this life or the next life and they see their duty as at least if they don't go after you and kill you to dissociate completely from you your own family will see you as like worse than a murderer because in islam you can even murder is a sin that can be forgiven, according to Surah 448, which you mentioned, brother. Allah can forgive anything, but if you associate with him, and in your case, our case, we associated with him, Christ, then you're worse than even a murderer, and you deserve everything that happens to you. Go on. Amen. And in my case, I know at least of... Um... Two men, and I say men intentionally because we get the impression that at least men uh, have a better status, for instance, or maybe just because they are men, somehow they can protect themselves and so on and so forth. Both of them were tricked by their families to uh, let them know that it's uh, okay for them to believe however they want to believe. In this case, both of them followed Jesus, and then both have disappeared. Till this day, we don't know what happened to them. We know that one of them is definitely alive, and we're thankful for that, but uh, this person cannot communicate with anyone outside uh, his immediate sphere. There is, there is an eye that is kept on him. He's being spied on. He's being uh, tricked. Uh, I mean, he's being entrapped all the time. I know of a female uh, who's also imprisoned in her own home uh, by her father. So, so these things are very serious. With that in mind, um, uh, do you think someone was asking, uh, one of our uh, amazing followers, Alistair, was asking about safe houses. Um, do you believe uh, something like that is is an alternative approach uh, to protect those, like, for instance, the women that you mentioned who lost their marriages or children or possibly being threatened by their spouses or, or, or uh, parents or others? I think that's a good idea, brother. I think the first thing is the recognition that, um, that class of people exist. Uh, we were talking, brother, a little about the West uh, before we started. How the West does not um, recognize, well it, well, it wants to show Islam as this peaceful religion. And so it goes against their narrative to recognize that ex-Muslims are in such danger because, you know, how can the peaceful religion cause that? So there is a class of people called ex-Muslims who require safe housing. Um, we don't. I don't find that uh, even in, in in the West where I live. I don't find that kind of idea uh, in people's minds. I mean, peop there are safe houses for ladies who uh, suffer from domestic violence or other things, but there isn't one. There isn't a recognition of a need for that uh, for people who've escaped Islam, apostates, because people are just not aware that it happens in the West. Even I think that's the first thing. Um, that's a good idea. But the main thing is, me, I believe, is uh, addressing the root of the problem. And the root of the problem is the ideology of Islam and the Islamic sources. I think that, um, I know it's a radical thing to, to think it's possible, but I, I believe in God, with God, everything is possible. Only when Islam as a religion and a belief system is wiped off the face of the earth will people be safe. Uh, or if Muslims leave 
the religion or move away from the religion and the resources so much that they stop practicing Islam, will people be safe and there might will not be a need for um, housing? That's what I think. Amen. And, and the danger, of course, is not just um, against us, but sometimes it goes beyond us and it starts impacting our own family. Sister Rehana here, I just uh, posted her uh, comment on the screen. Her own family and father were being called names like your Satans or Shaitan. Why? Because they're being mocked that your daughter or, or let's say in general, one of your uh, uh, household have left Islam. You're weak. You cannot really protect uh, Islam and the honor of Islam. You cannot really keep your flock, uh, you know, in your own, uh, uh, basically, um, you know, uh, 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 household. Uh, you cannot really silent uh, the critics from within and so on and so forth. So um, have you found, uh, you know, this to be the case, uh, for instance, when you left Islam, that any members of your home were attacked by the community, by the friends, by the cousins, by the relatives? Um, what I found was there's a lot of shame. They were ashamed, my family were, to tell people even that this has happened. Um, they, a lot of the anger that I got against me was that, look what you've done to us. Now, you know, we will be shamed. Um, like for example, they, they would say that you didn't raise her properly. You didn't raise her in the right way, strictly enough. You gave her too much freedom and now she left. Uh, or you, you you raised her to want you know to not be grounded in Islam enough, and people will use these accusations and um, shame to shame the family, and they don't realize that it's not the, the 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 fault of the person who's left; it's the fault of the whole system. It's a whole system of the the shame and the honor thing. That you know, why can't people leave? Can I ask you that, brother? Why can't Islam be okay with people who leave? Well, I mean, it's interesting, a question, by the way, uh, when we think about it from an ideological standpoint, um, an ideology is threatened when members of its uh, group begins to turn its back on it and leave because it sends a couple of messages. First, it sends a message that this ideology is wrong or there is something wrong with it. And number two, uh, the the uh, leaders of this ideology begin to think we're being weakened in numbers, you know, so they think of it in numbers, in quantity rather than in quality, for instance. And then it's an image thing, obviously. And uh, the only way you can keep people uh, following you or believing in you is by intimidation. I mean, and, and that's exactly what Islam is. Islam is an ideology. Islam is threatened by the fact that people can dare to stand up against it. I mean, who is actually the author of Islam? And let, let, let us re really be frank here. Islam represents the ultimate spiritual warfare led by Satan himself. I mean, the, the, the founder of Islam himself admitted that the first time he received revelation, he was uncomfortable. He thought he was demonically possessed. Now, show me a single example in the whole Bible that one messenger of God, one prophet, one apostle ever doubted that it is a message from God that they received and assumed that they were demonically possessed. Right there, it's telling that the author of Islam, the composer of Islam, uh, Muhammad in this case, wasn't even sure that he received a calling from God and his wife had to do an amazing test I mean, a laughable test, actually, to try to convince him that what he saw was an angel from God. I mean, I mean, how, how, how ridiculous can it get other than that? When, when you have someone else telling you that you're a messenger, a prophet, and you yourself don't even know if you are. Show me a simple example like this in the whole Bible that someone needed other person who wasn't even present at the event, who didn't even know what an angel would look like or behave, somehow will convince you that you are follower of the truth. If that's the case... I can tell you I am a prophet. I mean, I, I know for sure I'm a prophet because I get dreams all the time. I mean, uh, so, and I don't need anyone to tell me that. So if, if we're going to start making up stories like this, no wonder then we have a lot of false religions and false messiahs. And that's exactly what Jesus says. False uh, uh, Christ and false messiahs. He, he says uh, uh, false messengers and false messiahs or false prophets and false messiahs will arise and deceive, if possible, even the elect. I mean, that's how powerful it is. Why? Because you have Satan, 
the ultimate deceiver, the liar, the father of all lies, the murderer from the beginning, who is behind these ideologies. And no wonder Peter described him this way in 1 Peter 5, 8. He says, be of sober spirit. This is serious, he's saying. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, notice he is our adversary. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He's not seeking me to give me a hug. He's seeking me to destroy me. And so when we put things in perspective, we begin to understand why Islam doesn't tolerate freedom of religion. Uh, amen, brother. And um, actually, I would take it um, as well and ask this question, where did Jesus or any of his apostles ever said, if someone leaves the faith, kill them? Never. Because we just don't see that kind of um, fragile ego, uh, uh, fear of, you know, apostasy and rejection in the in the Bible, because the the the, the gospel message and the truth that's in the Bible, the, the the commandments, the way of Jesus Christ is so sure and secure. They don't need followers to never leave. Just we just don't see that. Like um, first, in, it says in First John, if they they went out from us, they, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. That's it. And you know, um, you have the verse where. Um, if, if a town rejects you, you just shake the dust off your feet and walk on. Doesn't say kill them, compel them, use the sword, or if they leave the faith, then do that to them. We only find that in Islam. And that shows the difference for people who say it's the same God. It isn't, uh, it's one, you got one fake God with his fake prophet, uh, begging, <laughs> uh, compelling people to come to him and then scaring them with death lest they leave. And you got another saying, Come if you want. If, if, the, if you leave, you're, you are not one of us. And, you know, you walk on. You leave them. Uh, that's the difference. Amen. Amen. Uh, I want to just uh, put a, a, a little bit of a, a humor here uh, because this is a sober topic and it really touches me personally myself. But, but we have uh, one of our followers, uh, Toothless Bulldog 2.0. He's apologizing to me for misspelling my name. Toothless uh, Bulldog, I cannot believe you misspelled my name. You know, how could you do that? Your salvation is lost, my friend. That's what happens when you misspell my name. But no, brother, don't worry about it or sister. Um, I get that all the time, by the way. So um, I'm thankful that uh, you at least you're here. And hopefully you and others will benefit from what we're sharing here. Now, I want to share another sobering passage from the Lord's mouth himself. In the book of Revelation, that's the word of Christ. I love it when Muslims say, well, show me what did Jesus say? I'm God. Go to the book of Revelation. Clearly, he's talking to you as God. But here's what he said to one of the churches in Revelation 2.10. And notice, and, and this is to everybody, notice what he says and how he connected tribulation to Satan. He says this, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil, notice, he's immediately connected to the devil. The devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested. Now, I love this. Because I want everyone to know that, at least in the case of my sister here, myself, we know why we go through tribulation. It's a testing of faith. I mean, that's exactly what the book of James tells us. We go through all kind of tribulation. So we're no exception. Each one of you here and other believers will go through these kind of testing. But it's a testing of faith. And then the Lord proceeded to say, and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Notice what he says. He didn't say, and you will not have tribulation. You will have tribulation for a period of time. It is part of our program, training program. I call it the boot camp. If you follow Jesus, you go through a boot camp and you have to endure to the end and you have to learn that your identity in Christ will not bring people to give you a hug and give you a kiss or love you. It will bring a lot of people that will be standing against you even from within your own family. And then he says, be fruitful, until death notice what the lord is expecting from us not to waver not to change our mind we need to be steadfast we need to be fruitful what is fruitful to produce fruit what does that mean evangelize use our experiences to comfort others it's not about running and hiding it's about actually facing the challenge that we face and then he says, and I will give you the crown of life. Hallelujah. That's all we need. What do we need? What else do we need other than eternal life 
with our Lord and the crown of life that represents that. And that's all that matters to us. Somebody was asking, why did we leave Islam and why would we follow Jesus? Because only Jesus can give us eternal life and only Jesus that can give us the crown of life. Back to you, dear sister. Amen. Only Jesus. And um, it, there is no other, you know, there's no bigger reason. But if there was another reason, I would say because Islam is the most obvious uh, false religion there is, uh, like our brother um, David Wood says. Um, see the difference, brother, from what you've said um, to the, what the Quran actually says. Uh, Surah 16, verse 106. He who disbelieves in Allah after having believed, so that's us, who opens his chest to disbelief, that's us, on those is the wrath of Allah and they shall have a grievous punishment. Okay? So what is this punishment, brother? Murder. Um, those who left Muhammad's religion at the time were murdered. Um, and that's according to uh, Sahih Hadiths. If I'm allowed to say, brother, uh, Bukhari and Muslim. Muhammad, oh, are, are you sure it's Sahih now? Because many of our Muslim <laughs> friends, they think, uh, they think they're not Sahih anymore. Well, brother, I've seen them even want to deny Sahih Hadith, like saying, oh, even Sahih is not Sahih. But anyway, yes, it is Sahih Bukhari 6878. And it's repeated so many times, like from other, uh, not just Bukhari collections, Nisa'i collections and Muslim and others. It says, Allah's messenger said, the blood of a Muslim who confesses that none has the right to be worshipped cannot be shed except in three cases. So the blood of a Muslim cannot be shed except three cases. One is for murder, like if a Muslim murders another Muslim or someone else, they, they get you know, killed. A married person who commits adultery and the one who leaves Islam, becomes an apostate and leaves the Muslims. Then you can shed their blood. And uh, this was practiced. This was practiced by uh, the uh, the companions, brother, like I, Ali, for example, Muhammad's cousin. He burnt some people. Narrated by Krema, also from Sahih Bukhari 3017. He burnt them, burnt them alive. And th this news reached Ibn Abbas, who said, "Had I been in his place, I would not have burnt them." And you think, "Oh, okay, that's good. <laughs> There's some mercy here." But then he said. The Prophet said, do not punish anybody with Allah's punishment, which is the fire. No doubt, I still would have killed them, he said. For the Prophet said, if somebody discards his religion, kill him. The Prophet said, if somebody discards his religion, kill him. Uh, and that was na uh, narrated by so many people. It's repeated so many times, Muhammad saying this. But, but dear sister, I thought there is no compulsion in religion. Isn't that what Islam teaches in chapter 2, verse 256? I mean, what's going on? I mean, uh, what 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 sources are you relying on here? Yeah, no compulsion <laughs> until you, you become Muslim. But then once you're in, once you're in, you're in. It's like the mafia. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you are free to live however you want until you enter Islam. Then you're not free to leave at all. Uh, and that's what also narrated Bukhari 7157. A Jewish person, brother, came to Islam which uh, we're told in back in the home countries is like, that's really rare, <laughs> right? Um, narrated Abu Musa, a man embraced Islam and then went back to being a Jew, Jewish, as in the Jewish faith again. And then someone called uh, Ma'ad ibn, ibn Jabal, who is one of like the most closest people to Muhammad. He saw him, he saw the man with uh, Abu Musa. So Ma'ad asked him, what is wrong with him? And then Abu Musa said, oh, he embraced Islam, then went back to Judaism. Ma'ad said, I will not sit down unless you kill him. Because he just saw him. He just saw, he said, I will not sit down with you until, until you kill him, as it is the verdict of Allah and his messenger. Yeah. So do you see? And I, I, Exactly. And, and I'm glad you mentioned an example like this. I want people to know that every single Muslim gives themselves the right to attack an ex-Muslim or a follower of Jesus in this case, simply because it is the sources they follow that commands them to do this. Remember what I said earlier, the God of Islam is so weak that he has to rely on his sinful followers to try to protect his integrity because he, he's a God that has no integrity whatsoever. He has no honor whatsoever. He's a figment of someone's imagination, nothing but an idol, a stone 
that people smoosh all the time. That's what it is. They bow down to a stone, they touch a stone, they throw a stone, and they kiss a stone. That's all they do. It's a stone that cannot hear nor can comprehend anything. No prayers will be answered, nothing like that. And therefore, it causes more frustrations to the followers of this stone, thinking that somehow this stone's honor has been attacked. Now, let me let me show another thing. This is what our Lord says. In fact, one of the passages that comforted me when I went through the severe persecution at the beginning of my walk with Christ is what Jesus says, for instance, one in many places. An example is John 15, 18. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. You hear what he says? He says, I'm your model. I'm your example. I was hated by the world, so you're not better than me. A servant is not better than his master. And our Lord always gave us an example of that. So we're so thankful that we follow a Lord that tested these trials, went through these tribulations. So I'm comforted because he died and rose again and conquered death. I will die and rise again and conquer death. He's alive and I will be alive forever with him. That's the God that we follow. Yes, brother, Muslims don't uh, realize that when they, what they have in their religion of the killing of apostates, killing of people who come to Christ, uh, is actually confirming the truth of our faith. Because of the verses that you mentioned, um, they were the verses that comforted me as well, um, the one in John uh, 15 that you mentioned. Because it, Jesus came first and he predicted these things. Um, he said that we will be hated by all for his name's sake. And that is exactly what happens when, because Islam is so dark, it's the antithesis, it's the, an, it's the opposite side of Christ almost. It's the darkest, uh, to my knowledge, the darkest of uh, the religions. It does exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ said they would do to the letter, to the letter. They, will, they deliver the ex-Muslim Christians. They deliver them to the courts in Muslim countries. They kill them. They persecute them. They exile them. They flee. They, um, they have. They have to flee. Uh, ever since the time of Muhammad, brother, ex-Muslim Christians have had to flee, including his own cousin, um, which I think I, I told you before we started, brother. His own cousin called Ubaid, Ubaid Allah ibn Jahsh. It's Muhammad's uh, cousin, son of his paternal uh, aunt. He went to Abyssinia. And he left Islam and became a Christian. And he was married to uh, a lady called uh, Umm Habiba. He couldn't come back. Why couldn't he come back, brother? Because he knew what was waiting for him. Because he left Islam for Christianity. And guess what Muhammad did, brother? Yes. To his wife when she came back. He took her as his own wife. As punishment. Yeah, well, because Islam teaches that if a husband or a wife leave Islam, then uh, the marriage is not binding anymore. I mean, so in fact, they would force you to divorce your spouse uh, one way or another. And uh, he, he's related to Zainab, right? Zainab Correct. Bintajash. Yeah. Correct. And he is the brother of Zainab bin Tajash. Uh, for people who don't know, that's the Zainab. And Zainab also. <laughs> that, yeah, he, that's the Zainab that was married to his adopted son, Zaid. So everybody ended up with him brother <laughs> like he was collecting wives yeah of course of course uh, he's always looking for excuses uh to collect wives that's what he is uh, well uh, i want to mention another thing there's another form of persecution sometimes that uh uh befall a believer sometimes it's the academic side of things for daring to say something that is damaging to islam not necessarily attacking Islam, just, just researching something that the outcome of that research will be damaging to Islam. Can I give you an example? Of course. Dr. Daniel Brubaker. Here it is. This book right here. 20 examples of corrections that were done to early Quranic manuscripts out of a massive dissertation. 20 examples. Our dear brother faced a lot of attacks, mocking, ridicule for daring daring to show images of manuscripts of the Quran that has corrections. Never in this book or in his dissertation he ever mentioned the word Islam, attacked Islam, or mocked Islam, or said anything about the Quran. He was just a researcher. That's all he did. 
That's his crime, daring to publish research findings. This is the weakness of this God of Islam that cannot handle the truth. He can never handle the truth because, of course, our Muslim friends, like us, when we were following Islam, we believed with all of our heart, we follow a book that is what? Perfectly preserved. And then came this book and the images. Oh, dear Lord. It's not preserved at all. In fact, I encourage people to buy this book. It's very cheap. You'll find it on Amazon. We need to support our brother. He's doing amazing work. And he always mind his own. He never, ever does the type of work that we do as apologists or polemists. He's just a researcher. He's doing what he's called to do. And we want to support that again. Daniel Allen Brubaker. This is one of his books. We're praying for more publications as well. This one is called Corrections in Early Quranic Manuscripts. Do you have any comments uh, about just the academic field, if you wish? Uh, yes, I've watched uh, a few of uh, Brother Dan Brubaker's material. He's very calm, um, very objective. He just states the facts. He's very technical in his language. Like He's not like us. We just go full throttle, like, uh, like, like in polemics. or um, like He doesn't attack Islam. He just, like you said, he just mentions the facts and that could be enough to, um, facts can be enough to insult Islam. Facts can be enough to make you um, an enemy of Islam and a, a target of persecution. Even if you say them with like the utmost neutrality, you're still an enemy. <laughs> and, uh, but brother, I have hope that as time goes on and things become more open, at least uh, on the online, uh, in the online world, um, you know that Islam will will not will not stand up to it. Uh, you know, before in history, um, Islam could um, censor things; it could stop things. It can, you know, you can have your books not be published. For example, like um, do you remember, brother, um, the book Satanic Verses that was like you, you couldn't publish them in, in Muslim countries, things right, like that. Directly. Yeah. But now everything is available. You know. Uh, you know, to everyone online, it's just a matter of time that they can't keep censoring things. And Islam, Islam just crumbles in front of any criticism. Islam just, it's so, so weak. Amen. And uh, for those who are interested in uh, knowing about what our dear sister is talking about concerning Dr. Brubaker, he has his own YouTube channel called Variant Quran. And you can subscribe to it, of course, to encourage you even to support him. Uh, but all that to say is that I remember him one time doing just a video Q&A, just questions that he received and responded to. One questioner wasn't even asking a question saying, Dr. Brubaker, we refuted your argument. And Dr. Brubaker in a very calm manner says, what's there to refute? It's just an image. So <laughs> how can you refute an image of a real manuscript that shows corrections in it? Many by the way, Islamic scholars in the field acknowledge that these are corrections, but obviously they cannot really come out publicly for the same reason, because they will face uh, basically uh, uh, a lashback against them. Yes. So, dear sister, do you have other uh, other examples from the Hadith or the Sunnah uh, or uh -huh. the Quran in general uh, that can back up the lack of freedom of religion, for instance, or the... Uh, alleged, uh, uh, you know, uh, punishment that can befall against infidels? Oh, oh, yes. Many more than I can count. Uh, and it starts with Muhammad himself. Um, so Muhammad, brother, he dealt very dictate, like in a dictator way with um, apostates. And um, for people who think Islam was like so golden in the beginning, no, people left Islam from the very beginning, during the time of Muhammad, they met him and they left Islam and they were the closest people to him, brother. Uh, like, you know, the scribes, the people who used to write the Quran as it was, quote unquote, revealed to Muhammad, they used to be there and he used to dictate it. His scribes left Islam. Uh, the famous one, brother, that people would know about, his name is Abdullah ibn Abi Sarh. He used to write, uh, be dictated the, the Quran by Muhammad. He, um, in, in, um, in the story, it's written in uh, Asbab al-Nuzul by al-Wahidi. They came to Surah 23, verse 14, right? And they were talking about the embryo. And then uh, uh, Abdullah ibn Abi Sarh, he said, Blessed is Allah, the best of creators. And Muhammad said, oh, wow, that is exactly how Allah revealed it to me. Write it down. So he was like, whoa. He so he doubted. He said, 
if Muhammad is truthful, then Allah is revealing to me too. And if he's a liar, then he just took he just took what I said and he claimed it for himself. So he apostatized. So what happened to him, brother? He ran away. Why did he run away? Because Muhammad made his blood lawful. He said, you know, his blood is to be shed. His blood is no longer sacred. And he ran away. Um, and um, another, bro another scribe, brother, who was unnamed in the Muslim source sources, narrated by Anas ibn Malik, he was also dictated. So that's like the new employee, right? The new scribe. Guess what happened? He also uh, left Islam. Why? Because as they were writing the, the, the Quran, uh, the scribe would ask, shall I write Allah all knowledgeable, all wise, Alim and Hakima, or shall I write all hearing, all seeing, Samia and Basir? And Muhammad, guess what Muhammad said to him? Iktub kayfa shit. Write whatever you like, Muhammad said. People who th think the Quran is word for word, letter for letter, your own prophet, fake prophet Muhammad used to tell to his scribe, write whatever you like. <laughs> Just choose. Exactly, and, and I don't know why our Muslim friends are upset because indeed, if you look at the early Quranic manuscripts, uh, the scribes wrote whatever they liked. The meaning is still close to what the original possibly might have said, uh, meaning if you compare two together, you'll see that it's the same meaning. One wrote it one way, the other wrote it the other way. So is it about the meaning or is it about the literal writing? And which way was it revealed? This way or that way? And which way is it preserved in heaven? This way or that way? I mean... Uh, let, let us just not really, um, uh, you know, uh, lie to ourselves. I mean, there is, there is, there are problems with the way the Quran was transmitted. So I would advise our Muslim friends just to get it over with, acknowledge that the Quran is a man-made book, and just move on. That's the only solution you have. Otherwise, if you're gonna try to convince anyone that the Quran is uh, is a perfectly preserved book, you're going you're gonna to really make yourself a laughing stock because everybody knows this. We're living the age of social media. Everything is out there. Everything is on the net. No one needs to go to libraries anymore. They find anything. Somebody put an image somewhere, and you're going to have now to spin your wheels trying to defend it. Might as well just leave Islam, become an apostate, come to Jesus. He saves. That's the only way. Other than that, you're really leading a man who is leading you to nowhere, basically. Well, my question is, brother, how can Muhammad be so uh, cavalier about it? Like he just told people that he's a prophet from Allah and Allah is revealing stuff to him. How can he be so careless and tell the scribe, write whatever you like? Did he not, was he not worried that it would look bad? Like he was so careless. And then what happened was the scribe became an apostate, just like the previous one. And they, he, and then he escaped. He escaped. Why? Because he knew his head would be on the line, just like the previous scribe. And uh, he died while he was, um, you know, a fugitive. They didn't catch him. So that's a good, a good thing. So that's so. Do you do you see the do you see the destiny of all the people who are, uh, become apostates? Yeah, and Abdullah ibn Abi I mean, uh, when he was holding on, uh, I mean, he, at least yeah. his cousin Uthman brought him to Muhammad. Yes. And, uh, you know, after they left, Muhammad was upset with the guys behind him. He's like, I was quiet. How come no one of you struck him with your by the sword? I mean, it, it, is this a, a prophet of mercy? Is this the guy who is a mercy to mankind? What mercy? Are, we, are you joking? Are you kidding me? What mercy are you talking about? This is a guy that doesn't like at all anyone who will expose his lies. And that's what Abdullah ibn Abi Sarh did. I mean, I love it. All of his scribes have some funny stories. Abdullah ibn Abi Sarh couldn't believe that this guy is a prophet because he was making up the Quran as he went. And then you have uh, uh, Ubayy ibn Abi Kaab who didn't even know the Quran was revealed in seven Ahruf. It's like, really? I mean, I didn't know that. When, when was that? When did that happen? I was one of your scribes. I, uh, exactly, brother. I wouldn't say he's mercy to mankind. He's the begrudging mercy to mankind. He all, he only let him go begrudgingly. He wanted to kill him, just like he said. But when Osman interceded for him and there were people around, oh, merciful prophet, please let him go, please. He repents, he repents, prophet. He was like, okay, then I'll leave him. <laughs> but, you know, inside he was seething. He wanted, he wanted blood, right? For people who say when Muhammad entered Mecca, he was so, he said, oh, I'll let you all go. I'm so merciful. He, the guy was sat there seething because he couldn't, because no one could see on his face that he wanted the guy dead. That's Muhammad. Um, there's yeah. another one, another one, brother, called Abdullah ibn Khattal. 
who find Islam, you find his story in Dala'il uh, al-Nubawa by Al-Bayhaqi. Uh, narrated Ibn Ishaq that Muhammad ordered him to be murdered because he left Islam and had some of his singing girls sing derogatory things about uh, Muhammad. He said, murder him even if he's holding on to the, Ka to the Kaaba, even if he's, right. because people took it as refuge. Um, he said, even if, you know, and it's meant to be a safe place. Remember, even the Quran says the Kaaba is a safe place from bloodshed. Yeah, and they killed a number of them. When they entered Mecca, there were a few of them that they killed, even though they were holding to the Kaaba, except uh, Abdullah ibn Abi Sarh, uh, uh, at least went to talk to his cousin, Uthman. Oh, isn't Uthman the guy who wrote the Quran, actually, that we have in our hand today? He burnt, he burnt the Quran. But <laughs> yeah. He ought to have been killed for burning all those Qurans that Muhammad was dead at that time. I mean, you notice a theme here? Anytime something exposes Islam, you either burn other copies, kill people who are standing up against it, or torture them, or stone them, or do whatever the case might be, or label them, or come up with this phrase that everybody talk about called Islamophobe. I'm going to start to invent my own, by the way. There is a Christian phobe. Uh, we're going to start using that. And there are many other phobes that uh, we're going to talk about because, I mean, uh, uh, Islam is no exception. I mean, there are so many other groups that are being attacked, you know, and mocked, and uh, we have to really lobby behind them. You see, that's where Christians can unite. But the problem is we have a lot of brothers and sisters who like to cheer, but they do not unite together to stand up for the truth. Why? Because we're afraid of persecution. That's usually the reason why we cannot unite. Yet the Muslims unite together. And they will attack anyone and everyone, even if they disagree with their ideologies. I mean, it really saddens me, dear sister. I don't know how you feel about that. Um, it's sad, brother. I think Christians who are not used to Islam or don't know much about Islam or maybe live in the West, they don't know the evil of Islam or the sources of Islam. They just don't know. They have no idea how dark it is. Um, they see, you know, normal Muslims going about their lives. They don't associate them with the kind of evil that's in the religion itself. And I, I kind of understand that. But we know, we know the kind of evil that's in Islam because we know the sources and we, we also know Muslim countries who have Islam as their source of legislation and Sharia. We know people who have been in the news, who have apostatized, who run for their lives, who been killed, who have had their families be targeted, who've been lynched. We know. So I feel that um, w perhaps that gives us more of a motivation to be against it. But I guess they, if I could give them an excuse, I guess they don't know how bad it is. And if they knew, they would do anything to fight it and to, in a way, not worry about so much about persecution, to just get rid, to be rid of that kind of evil. That's what I'm thinking. Amen. Well, in the, look, in the next uh, maybe few minutes, uh, first, let's start by asking this. What do you think could be done or more could be done by the Christian community to help those who leave Islam, even those who still didn't embrace Christ? Let's say that they are in danger just for simply leaving Islam, which is a movement right now. A lot of youngsters are leaving Islam. So what do we do? Any uh, you know suggestions from your side? Um, I would, of course, as a Christian, you show people love and uh, concern and you care about their physical well-being as well as their spiritual um, state. As a Christian, um, I would obviously now that, you know, you have an idea of their suffering or the thing that they can they face is, you know, help them find a safe place, take them in. And as soon as they're safe, I would share the gospel with them, brother. Um, I think the only way an ex-Muslim, obviously we care about their souls, we want them to be saved, their, 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 their spiritual state, their, their, you know, they're spiritually dead still, even if they are being persecuted, they're spiritually dead. And the Lord Jesus Christ uh, is, is, is the first, being, their being saved is the first, um, is the first priority as, as, as soon as they're safe physically is what I say. Also because I believe and I know for sure, ex-Muslims who are in Christ have way more, uh, a lot more strength to deal with the, uh, you know, the, the 
persecution and the, the, the danger because of we have the Lord Jesus Christ. We have God by our side and we have way more than anything we have lost. We have uh, not only eternal life, we have an inheritance with him. We have um, his love, his forgiveness, his presence. He's walking with us every day. We have his word. You just gain so much by being in Christ. So ex-Muslims who leave Islam, the first step is great that you've left the evil. But then if you've left Islam and you're still standing nothing, the devil is still one. You know, you fall into atheism or agnosticism or you just walk around without a direction, without stability. It's very easy for them then to be pulled back into Islam because of family. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of blackmail that, you know, come back and all that. And then you get dragged back into that evil unless you have Jesus Christ as your anchor and you find the truth and you, you embrace the light then you'll be safe forever spiritually and if the Lord wills physically until, you know, you, we meet him, until he takes you home. But I would say give them a safe, help them with their safety and share the gospel with them as soon as you can. Amen. And I second that. And the second question I want us to close with uh, is what do we tell our Muslim friends? Uh, I mean, we know some of them will be upset about what they're hearing. Uh, some of them will claim that we are lying. Some don't want to even, uh, uh, you know, understand uh, where we're coming from or even appreciate the fact that we are raising awareness of our persecution. Some even may think that we deserve it. But what do we tell them in general and specifically those who are really paying attention to what's happening, contemplating, leaving the faith or have left the uh, Islam already and uh, maybe followers of Jesus or just don't know where to go? I would ask Muslims who are listening. One, do you sympathize with us or not? If you don't sympathize with us, ask yourself why. The reason Muslims can't sympathize uh, with the victims of their religion is because Islam has darkened their hearts so much that they're not able to sympathize with another human being because of the hold that Islam has on you. That's number one. And also, brother, I think subconsciously they know that if they start sympathizing with us, they will start blaming Islam for the harm that it's doing and the persecution that it's doing to us. And they will end up leaving Islam and they themselves become the next victim of Islam. So it's like a defensive, uh, protective technique, basically a preemptive thing against themselves being the next victim. That is something I have noticed. That, so I'm asking Muslims now, do you sympathize with us, with the ex-Muslims that have left Islam since the time of Muhammad and been killed and been murdered and been and fled and still going through all these risks. If you sympathize with us, then we have hope, I have hope for you. Then that means you recognize this evil. And if you recognize this evil, why you're still in it? Um, family, the fact that, you know, family, friends, um, because it's easy, because you don't want to face um, the same thing we're facing, you have to face God with that. and you know that's not a good reason if you re recognize the evil of it then i would say leave it and there is an alternative it's called the following jesus christ that is the alternative so i say come come to the lord jesus christ and leave islam right right away and um if you don't then you'll have to face god for being part of this evil amen and uh, i just want to remind our muslim friends in particular uh, we love you the reason why we risk our life we come here on in front of the camera. We share with you about our experiences. We invite you to come to Jesus, not because we have an agenda. You may think we have an agenda. We have eternal life already. We're not seeking eternal life anymore. Our God assured us of it. We are going to spend eternity with him. So we're not working towards that at all. We got nothing to gain, but we are serving our Lord who invited us and says he's appealing through us as his ambassadors make an appeal, come to Jesus, come to God, make an appeal to follow Christ. He wants to reconcile with you. He wants to have peace with you so that you will not face eternal damnation. You will not be condemned. You will not be in the hellfire. He loves you and he came to die for you. And that's what we're doing. We're announcing it to you. We're reasoning with you. We're sharing the truth with you. We know you are very smart. The Lord has given you an amazing ability to reason and to think. And we ask you to search for the truth, 
pray for the truth and listen to the conviction of the Holy Spirit because one day you will be judged for this very show that you're watching right now and you'll be reminded that both of us ex-Muslims, father of Jesus, shared the truth with you, invited you to examine it and you rejected not because the truth did not stand but because you cared so much about honor and image rather than to care about eternal life and being with the one who saved you and will give you that life that you will never be snatched out of his hand. Nothing will befall you. Even death will not separate you from him. So that's really my advice to you. We love you and we pray that you will at least consider, consider to come and see, come and see and give Jesus a chance. Your sister, final words. I want to speak to the Muslims who are thinking of leaving Islam but are too scared. Um, depending on your situation, I would say still leave it. Uh, uh, I said this before and I'm saying it again. The first place you can be free is in your mind and your heart. Even if Islam has oppressed, depending on where you live in the world, so much that you can't say it. Don't let Islam steal your eternity like it has oppressed the present time. Because... The first place you can be free is your heart and eternal life is very long compared to this life. So please come to Jesus Christ in secret if you can. And if you can publicly do that if you can, because I um, I know, brother, there are so many Muslims who want to leave, who want to leave Islam, but are scared of the consequences. There are so many. The numbers are so many. And I say, leave it, take that step. And then there will come a time because of the numbers that are growing. Um, that there will be it, where it, it will just be there will be just be too many of them to stay secret and it will be a time when people will come out publicly on mass and it will be safe but for that to happen we need people to take first steps take a first step towards Christ he will then make the way for the rest, for, for tomorrow and for the day after just make the first step now uh, we praise God for um Praise the Lord for people who are out with their face, like our brother here and others, um, who are spoke, speaking boldly. If you're able to do that and it's safe, do that. If you're not able to do that, um, do it to the extent that it's safe as much as possible. Because if evil isn't opposed enough, it will keep lingering and lingering and oppressing and oppressing. So please do your part to stop it. And the first thing you can do for yourself is have your own soul saved. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ and help others who are trying to do the same if you can. But don't stay in it out of fear, please, because then we will stay stay in it for uh, you know longer than we need to. That's what I say. Amen. And I want to close with the word of God. And I want to share with you the journey of a very well-known persecutor of the church who heeded to the voice of God was touched by him and was convicted by the Holy Spirit to become the most prolific advocate for the gospel. Of course, we're talking about the Apostle Paul and listen to the words that the Apostle Paul says towards the end of his life. He wrote this from prison, by the way, and he declared himself to be someone who is experiencing joy for knowing Christ, and, and I want to read these words and we'll close. So if you don't mind me reading a few verses here, dear sister, this comes from Philippians chapter three. I'm going to read just from verse four. This is what he says. If someone else thinks they are, or they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. So he's telling people, if you think you can save yourself by work, which sound like when we grow up as Muslims, let me tell you this, he says, I have enough reasons, he said, to brag about my past and my ability to save myself by work. In verse 5, he says, circumcised on the eighth day, meaning I followed the law of the people of Israel. I am of the chosen people, he says, of the tribe of Benjamin that bragged about the fact that they never abandoned the Lord because they were the one who stuck with Judah in the south. A Hebrew of Hebrews, this is really my origin. This is who I am. This is my race. This is my culture, which is a cause for him to brag about it. In regard to the law, a Pharisee, the top religious leader I was, he says, as for zeal, persecuting the church, 
meaning that I was going after the Christians that I perceived them to be heretics, to be infidels. As for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. I was following the law, he says, doing everything according to the letter of the law. Then verse 7 comes and he says, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, from work, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Amen. This is who we are in Christ. We abandon everything. We can consider everything a loss for the sake of knowing Christ, my Lord. Do you know that this is the only time in all of the 13 letters the Apostle Paul wrote, all of them, he used the phrase, my Lord, an intimate relationship with God. That's what saves. It's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. It's not a group thing. It's not an inheritant of religion. You are saved by making a relationship with Christ one-on-one, -on -one, and that's what matters. And that's my invitation to all of you, my Muslim friends. Thank you, our dear sister. I cannot wait, of course, until we have you back again to continue with other topics as always. Anything else you would like to add? Just uh, amen and amen and pray for uh, the ex-Muslim Christians and obviously for Muslims to come to Christ. Amen. Well, thank you so much, dear sister. Thank you so much for everyone. I saw a lot of our moderators uh, at this uh, time. Thank you for taking time to be with us. We miss some of you who couldn't join us, but we hope that you'll be able to watch. And our Muslim friends, if you're watching this, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, you can always uh, contact me through Facebook, uh, through our website, Sierra International, uh, in, in a variety of ways. We're here to uh, help and answer any of your questions. I want to also remind everyone that we are uh, doing our second annual uh, conference, online conference. It will be in October, from October 14th until October 16th. I've already uh, posted a flyer on my Facebook page and other pages as well. And uh, we will start doing videos on that, and I will interview some of the speakers as well. So hopefully you can join us and register for that. We would love to see as many of you as possible and uh, to benefit from uh, the uh, more than qualified speakers and uh, uh, teachers that will be uh, partnering with us to do this. Thank you so much, dear sister. Uh, we would love to have you again uh, when your time permits, of course. Uh, this is Al Fadi, everyone. God bless you. Over and out. Take care.